All right, we're ready when you are. Good. All right, well, we're live, guys, so um, hello world. <laughs> um, we're here today talking about global online aviation networks, um, but first I just want to uh, get a quick poll of the room. How many have, have been to Flight Sin Expo before this weekend? So you've been to two or more of the events. A couple of hands, three or more? No? Four or more? No, anybody? So I've been very blessed to be able to attend all five of these things, uh, Las Vegas in 2018 and then Orlando, uh, San Diego, Houston, and now back here. And I can attest, I can assure you that there's no greater event for rekindling re my passion for air conditioning. <laughs> um, I am not built for that out there. You can probably look at me and tell that. And uh, um, yeah, I, I've always said, I said for a long time that I was born in an air-conditioned room, and God willing, I'm going to die in an air-conditioned room. Um, but, uh, but anyway, I am uh, happy to be here to talk about global online aviation networks. Now, first of all, who am I? What qualifies me to be up, up here in front of you today? Um, first of all, I am a, uh, a flight sim enthusiast. I've been flying sim. Uh, flight sims for basically as long as they've been around since the early 80s. However, do take me with a grain of salt because I have 0.0, .0 hours in the uh, real world logbook. Um, I've been a member of that sim since uh, 2010, so the last 14 of those 40 years. Um, I've been something like 3,100 pilot hours. That's not as many as some people, but it's a pretty good number. Uh, I've been an air traffic controller on that sim uh, actively for the last six years. Um, and almost 1,000 hours of uh, controlling on, on VATSIM as well. Um, for those of you who know VATSIM and know the VATSIM community, you might have heard of VATSTAR. was a, a virtual pilot training organization that just recently closed up shop, but they opened in 2015, and I wrote most of their, well, almost all of their training and testing material when they first opened. Um, and then more recently, uh, the last six years, um, I've been a host of a Twitch live stream called Slant Alpha Adventures, Matter of fact, uh, we celebrate the sixth anniversary of that stream next week. So, I don't know, hopefully that, tells, that gives me, I have a little bit of insight into, uh, into what we're gonna cover for you today. Now, this is not a massive advertisement for VATSIM. Although, kind of looks like it is, doesn't it? <laughs> um, there are other global online networks besides VATSIM. VATSIM, as I mentioned, is the one that I have 14 years of experience with myself, so it's the one that I'm most familiar with, but there are others out there that are basically analogous, basically the same thing. Most of what I'm gonna to cover today applies to whichever one of those you would happen to want to join. What are we gonna to cover today? Well, I'm gonna start with what are global online aviation networks? What, what happens there? What goes on there? Uh, secondly, what are the pros and cons of joining a network like that versus just flying on your own, with, with or without uh, AI-generated traffic or AI-generated air traffic control. So why would, I, why would I join a network versus doing that? Uh, we're going to cover the basic things uh, that a new member on a network like that sim would really want to know, and then uh, what are the big pitfalls that you would want to avoid. Uh, so first of all, what are, the, what are these networks that we're talking about today? Um, we're talking about internet-based servers, servers or server networks that allow virtual pilots to connect and fly cooperatively together. Virtual human pilots, people like yourselves from all over the world to uh, join together. Um, there are some that focus on military. Digital combat sim is a real popular one, but we're focusing today on one where civilian aviation is the primary traffic um, and really, honestly, where realistic procedures and communications are used. So, um, as opposed to something like the multiplayer environment in Flight Sim 2020, which comes built in with the sim, that's more of a casual fly-along type thing. Um, there aren't really any rules that are enforced. Um, and it, it can be somewhat of a free-for-all in terms of coordination with other aircraft, and there's no really way to communicate with other aircraft. So we're talking about you know, a network, a separate network that you connect to that allows you to operate with other pilots with some sort of form of communication and with realistic procedures as well. 
and in particular VATSIM and IVAO, you can connect as a pilot or you can connect as a virtual air traffic controller. So that's what we're basically talking about. Uh, the big thing about these networks is they're not just the server infrastructure, but a network like VATSIM is also a community unto itself. And that the members of the VATSIM community um, congregate on forums or discussion boards, Discord is what I've pictured here. And so we just connect with each other in a lot more ways than just, uh, than just on the, the actual server network talking over our pretend radios. Um, a moment ago I discussed pros and cons, so let's talk about what some of them are. I am not here to, to convince you that you must get onto a network like that, Sim. I'm going to try and give you a, a really good taste of whether it's right for you or whether it might not be. Um, one of the biggest pros is that on a network like that, Sim, I think you're going to get a much broader variety of realistic instructions. Uh, and the way I like to say this is that um, when you're flying on your own, whether there's AI traffic around you, AI air traffic control, you're the most important pilot in the sky because you're the human player. And the rest of it is just generated around you to kind of make you feel like you're an immersive environment, but you're still the primary focus of what the, um, the AI generated ATC is trying to do. So I think one of the big misconceptions that new members of VATSIM have when they come in is that you can program your complete route from pavement to pavement, and your job is to take off the airplane and make it fly that exact magenta line path the entire way. And that is an easy misconception to have when you're the most important person in the sky every time you fly, but on a multiplayer network with other traffic around, um, you do have to be prepared for sometimes the case where you don't just fly what you filed. Okay, because there's other, other planes that need to be sequenced in ahead of you or behind you or what have you. Um, I think on a global network, you get a more realistic variety of people and styles and personalities. Now, I will tell you what, um, that sayintentions.ai trailer that we saw yesterday was pretty impressive. I will definitely be checking that out. Um, but I, I still think that there's no true substitute for a global community of actual people that you develop and, and connect with and learn their styles of communication and their personalities. Uh, the, the flip side of that is that it is sometimes difficult to understand them, especially if you're flying in a region where the native language that you speak is not the native language that they speak. They may speak with an accent or they may speak very quickly. They may not enunciate well. So you do encounter this more often on a global network than uh, when you're trying to listen to instructions that your AI ATC is giving you. Um, I don't want to overblow this one. It does happen that you happen across somebody who's not having a good day on the scopes and they get a little short. Um, it's, it's not common. It's more common if, uh, um, it's more common if there's folks on there that really are in over their heads. Um, and I'm not, con not condoning anyone being rude to a new pilot, but it just, it's, it's stressful from the controller side sometimes. Uh, and that is just something that you have to be aware of. Like I said, pros and cons. Um, it happens and hopefully, you know, going in knowing that you will encounter this from time to time will help you kind of shake it off. Um, some people are more able to be a little thick skinned in that situation than others. And so I get it. Um, that's part of the decision you need to make. Is this the right environment for me? I think the, the pros outweigh the cons in my opinion though. Um, I said fewer glitched instructions. Um, the AI ATC is getting better and better. Um, but there are still a lot of situations that AI doesn't seem to handle well, at least so far in my experience. Uh, very unique airspace, um, or if you're going to and from less common destinations and situations, particularly if you're IFR to a non-towered field, the instructions that you get from your AI ATC are often a little bit off somehow. Um, and then if, there's a, if you're VFR, and especially if you're in a situation where there's a mixture of VFR and IFR traffic, sometimes the instructions that you get from the AI ATC aren't quite what you would get in that real situation. Uh, notice I said fewer, not none, because that's in air traffic controllers aren't perfect either. <laughs> And I can attest to that personally. Um, really, one of the best aspects of joining a network like VATSIM or, or the others like it 
is the social aspect. This very event that we are at today grew out of an annual meetup of a pilot and controller online community. So it can't be understated the benefit of the, the social, the, the community um, feel that you get from joining a network like this. On the flip side of that though is what? Social anxiety, uh, fear of being judged. The way I like to say it is when you first key up that mic, a lot of people are really, really just petrified. Oh my God, I'm gonna sound like a fool. Um, the best advice I have for you is embrace that you will sound like a fool those first few times <laughs> because there's really no way to get better at it than being bad at it first. So yeah, you're gonna sound silly the first handful of times. Um, it's okay, set the bar nice and low and then just do a little bit better every time you go. Um, the three other things that we hear about reasons people you know, choose not to join a network like this. Uh, number one is they say it's difficult to set up the, uh, the program, the app to do it. Uh, it's getting more and more plug and play these days, but people do say, oh, I couldn't figure out how to install it, how to get it running. Um, sometimes people say, I don't want to fly on a network like that because AI ATC is available everywhere 24 seven um, on a network like VATSIM, IVAO. Uh, air, air, tra air traffic control coverage comes and goes, sometimes randomly, sometimes right as you cross into their sector. So, um, so that's a, a reason you might not want to, to join a network is that you won't get ATC coverage all the time, whereas in an AI environment you will. And then the, the other reason that we see in surveys for why people choose not to do uh, online um, human multiplayer is what happens if you're on short final and suddenly you have to take a phone call? Can't pause. Hey, everyone around, everyone, can you everyone pause for a second? Because I, I have to jump on a call real quick. Um, on a network like VATSIM, there are plenty of opportunities to step out of the cockpit for a few minutes, especially if you're at cruise, if your on route controller doesn't have a lot of sequencing to do with you at the moment, um, if you're not about to be handed off to the next sector. Hey, can I step out for a couple minutes? Um, you know, as I would say, uh, you know, I've got to go refresh the beverage, I've got to go run to the, uh, the little pilot's room. I call it liquid recycling, you know, liquid in, liquid out. I strongly encourage liquid recycling, by the way. Um, but yeah, you can do that, but not if you're on final. <laughs> um, let's talk about um, some of the basics that you need to understand. And this is going to be a lot to cover in 45 minutes. I apologize. I've even had to cut some of it um, just to keep it under time. So uh, we'll... Uh, We'll, we'll, we'll do the best I can to cover what I want to cover here. Um, so we're, we're going to start, uh, talk briefly about uh, choosing a proper call sign for the type of operation that you're doing. I'm, I cut the discussion on routes. I think if many of you, if you're kind of like in the intermediate simmer level and you've done some realistic flight planning, you have a basic understanding of how routes work. Uh, um, uh, you know, just sticking to airways. The way I like to say it is, uh, don't go chasing long directs, stick to the Tango Airways and the Victor Airways that you're used to. No music fans in the room? Okay, I, I figured no one would get that one, that's fine. I'll recover. Um, and we'll talk about charts and why it's important to, to have them um, and, uh, and where you can find them. And then we'll talk about um, the basics of air traffic control communications. Now, this is, as I said, a lot to cover in 45 minutes, so uh, I would like to refer you to a set of tutorials that I have on uh, my YouTube channel, um, where I cover a lot of this stuff in, in more intimate detail. So uh, please feel free to search up Slant Alpha Adventures on YouTube and a playlist called VATSIM Tutorials. And yes, I, I give you permission to use it even if you choose a network besides VATSIM, it's fine, I'll get over it. Um, but I cover a lot of these topics in a little bit more detail than I'm cramming in to today. All right, call signs. Um, when, you're, when you're connecting to a network, and, and I'll, I'll caveat this by saying, uh, you'll get a network ID that identifies you specifically, but when you connect each time you connect, you could be flying a different type of aircraft, you could be flying a different type of operation, a general aviation flight versus an air carrier type flight, and you will have the opportunity, most networks that I'm familiar with, you have the opportunity to, to do so under a different call sign each time you connect, if that's what you choose to do. 
Uh, the ba basics for air carrier call signs uh, is to remind you to use the three-letter ICAO identifier rather than the two-letter one that is on your ticket. That's the IATA identifier. So that's what's on the most of the passenger documentation. But for the pilots, uh, for the air traffic control, at least in particular, they're referring to the flights by their three-letter identifier. Uh, and I'll go over some examples of what I mean by that in a moment. Uh, the flight ID that comes after that uh, air carrier identifier is normally a number. And here in the States, we're used to it just being the same number that the passengers see on their tickets. Um, outside of the States, especially in Europe, they now have sometimes um, randomized a flight ID that is not the same as the flight number that's on the passenger ticket. And that's in order to reduce the number of similar sounding call signs on those frequencies, which are very, very jam-packed uh, frequencies. So to, in order to reduce confusion, they'll uh, assign an alphanumeric ID to the flight instead of using that flight number. Uh, some examples I put up on the screen. Um, Southwest 2904, you use SWA rather than WN as you connect to the network. Um, I, I, the, the other two examples here are interesting because there's a difference that I'll, uh, it's not on the slide, but it's, it's, it's a difference between what you log on as versus what you actually say over the radio. So in the case of Southwest, it's pretty straightforward, okay? It's SWA, the airline's name is Southwest, and the call sign for Southwest is, wouldn't you know it, Southwest. Um, the second one, MXY328, um, uh, would be spoken over the radio as Moxie. Anyone know? off the top of their head, which, which airline this is? Yeah, Breeze, Breeze Airways. So the airline's name is Breeze, but the call sign they use over the radio is Moxie plus the flight number, and as they log on to the scope, or as they appear on the scope, it would be MXY328. And then this last one, British Airways, again, BAW, the airline's name is British Airways, the ICAO is BAW, so far so good. Anyone know what the spoken call sign for British Airways is? Speedbird, right. So sometimes the spoken call sign is just the airline name, sometimes the spoken call sign matches the ICAO uh, identifier, and sometimes it's just a different word that, um, that is used uh, as their spoken call sign. So just be, uh, be cognizant of the difference between what you log on as and what you say. We'll talk about uh, general aviation call signs, private call signs. Um, these formats are gonna be different depending on where in the world you are. And in the US, we're used to the uh, N numbers, the letter N followed by up to five numbers, with the last one or two of those being letters instead. Um, other places, it's uh, five letters, where the first letter or the first two letters is a country code, and then the rest of it is just randomly assigned. Uh, and then even other places, the, the last part, the randomly assigned part, might not be just letters. So it, it's kind of like if you as, you, as you drive around in the US, you see license plates from all different states, and every state kind of has its own format for what order the letters and numbers come in. It's kind of the same thing in terms of uh, aircraft registrations. Examples here, and again, I'm gonna to touch on the difference between what you log on as and what you say. Um, what you log on as would be, in my case, November 514 Delta Victor. And that is what you can say, but in the US we have that we're, yeah, a lot of places you, globally you have this convention where you can drop the letter N and replace that with your make or your model. So you could say Citation 514 Delta Victor or Comanche 514 Delta Victor. But I'm not gonna log on and connect with the word Comanche and the numbers. I'm still gonna put, when I log on, I'm gonna connect with this N and then the numbers. So again, difference between what you say versus how you appear on the scope. Uh, finally, military call signs. I'll just give you the caveat that uh, depending on the network that you're flying on, there might be some restrictions on what type of military activity you can do. Um, so just you should check with whatever network you sign up for and uh, see what those restrictions are. Um, uh, the most common military tact, uh, call sign that you'll find is what they call the tactical call sign, which is the squadron name, uh, which is shortened down to a four or five letter code and then a, a one or two digit identifier after that. So uh, you'll see things like bogey 23 or thug 01. Uh, occasionally you see the service based call signs with just, just the, um, at the service identifier A for Air Force. Uh, US Navy uses VV, Victor Victor. Um, and then the 
identifying flight number that goes after it. Um, let's talk about charts and where to find them and uh, why. Well, we'll talk about why it's important to have them when you're flying in a moment. But first of all, where do you find them? Uh, in the US, we've got a website called Sky Vector that has uh, you know, the complete FAA repository kind of uh, built into it. AirNav is another one that's uh, commonly used. It's, uh, some folks prefer it just because it's got an easier search function. Just type in which chart you're looking for and it pops up. Um, you can even go as a sim pilot to the FAA's own Digital Terminal Procedures publication. It's the very same one that a real world pilot would use. And uh, the FAA just makes that free access without having to sign up for any kind of an account. So that's one of the reasons why flying in the US, I think, is, is so much easier, not because it's just my home region, time zones match up, but also free access to every chart that you might want to need. Um, outside of the US, in Canada, there's a site called flightplan.com, FLTplan.com. Um, you do need a registration for that, but it's free. Um, and once you do that, you will have access to, again, the very same charts that real world pilots would use when flying in Canada. Outside of the US and Canada, it can sometimes be difficult to find charts for the procedures for the, the origin and destination that you might be using. Um, some countries publish theirs freely, like, uh, like here. Others, um, they charge a fee for those charts because it's how they pay for their aviation infrastructure. So you can't always come across them very easily. Um, there's an organization called ChartFox that is, that is specific to VATSIM where uh, some, a volunteer group has collected most of the free ones into one single source, so you can use that if you're a VATSIM user. Sometimes if you just jump on Google, punch in the country name and the word, uh, the, or the, yeah, the uh, letters AIP, which stands for Aeronautical Information Publication, you can search it that way too if you're having trouble finding it. Uh, sometimes you can find country, uh, yeah, countries' charts that uh, aren't on ChartFox or, uh, or you, you, that you don't have access to another way. Um, many of us are familiar with Navigraph, as we found out yesterday. I think the entire room was. They have an app called uh, Desktop Charts, which is global. It is a subscription service. Um, so for those who fly on a tight budget, you know, it, it, it's uh, obviously affordability is in the eye of the beholder, as I like to say. So whether it's, uh, whether it's worth it to you to uh, subscribe to this service is... Uh, is your, is your personal decision to make. I, th I tend to think that it's a very good value um, and they're not paying me a stipend, I wish they were. <laughs> um, I tend to think that it's a very good value because it gives you charts for the entire globe all in the same format. So the one thing about each country that publishes their own AIP, the charts format is slightly different. So on one chart, the minimums might be in this corner. On another chart, the minimums are listed up top. In another chart, they're in red. Um, the format of the Navigraph charts are all based on the real world uh, company called Jepson, which uh, produces charts for uh, real aviation. Um, but uh, but it is the, the benefit is that they look the same no matter where in the world you're flying, which is a nice thing to have. Now, why is it important to have them with you while you're flying? Why can't you just plug in the procedures into your FMC and then you're good to go? The plane just does its thing. The plane just follows the procedure. Why do you have to have the chart in front of you? Um, SIDs and STARS, which are standard instrument departures, standard terminal arrivals, uh, it, very common to have these at your larger, uh, busier commercial hubs uh, in and outside of the U.S. And uh, you know, many of you, like I said, if you've done some rudimentary flight planning, you're familiar with these to some extent. Um, but there are instructions on these charts in addition to just the list of the waypoints. And it's very important that you kind of look over these charts and understand what those instructions are. And in particular, what you do at the beginning, right as you leave the runway, in what manner am I joining this SID? It's very important. It's not always just turning directly to that first point. Uh, at the end of the star, what happens after I hit the last point in the star and I'm getting ready to fly my approach? What do I do in the middle? Very important that you know this. Uh, in a single player environment, not so important. You can do whatever you want. Multiplayer environment with other traffic you're being sequenced around, very important that you know what you should be doing as you cross that last point. Uh, in the case of approaches, at the very least, you want to know where the, uh, the minimums and the missed approach instructions are. 
and you want to read those over. Uh, for taxiway diagrams, very important that you have the taxiway diagram. A lot of SIM pilots, they think, oh, well, if I get a taxi instruction from that SIM controller, I'll just, I'll just enable the taxiway routing with the arrows that I can just follow in the plane. Well, the problem is um, you might get a different route from the, the, the VATSIM controller than what your SIM thinks you're getting. So if you follow the arrows, you're going a different way. Um, and the other problem that you occasionally run into is that the layout of your airport in the SIM might not be fully up to date, and the VATSIM air traffic controller is working off of a more current chart. Now, this is occasionally a problem, but usually if you have a chart and you can compare what's on the chart to what's in your SIM in front of you, you can kind of work around these. Oh, this is, he's telling me to turn right on Bravo 8, but this is now called Bravo 9, but it's definitely the one that's right here at the end of the runway. Okay, I've got it, it's, it's the same thing. So you do have to kind of figure out things on, on your own that might be slight discrepancies. But you definitely want to follow in general terms the route that your VATSIM air traffic controller gives you and not just some random route that you want to take to the, to the runway. And again, it, it stems from the concept of you're not the most impor important pilot in the situation. Uh, a lot of times at these busier air traffic control, uh, busy, yeah, these busier uh, VATSIM events, you know, we might be queuing up the, so say you're here at LA, uh, uh, LAS, Las Vegas, and there's 30 planes in line to go to um, Los Angeles LAX, and you're going somewhere else. You don't want to get stuck in the queue for LAS, at, for LAX when you could be on your way in five minutes because you're going somewhere that is not being overloaded with traffic. So you definitely want to follow the correct taxi instructions because you may get a shorter queue than the uh, event traffic or what have you. Um, We'll talk basics of communications, and I do have a tutorial on YouTube which covers this in about 16 and a half minutes. Today I'm gonna to try and cover it in three and a half minutes, so I apologize again for the pace, but I think we can kind of rip through the, uh, the basics here. Um, very first thing that you want to be um, able to do is to check in with a new controller. And it's, it, it can be a mouthful of things that you have to spit out in a quick sequence the good news is, though, that the format of that kind of follows the same pattern every time. Um, you start by saying their call sign, then your call sign, then your location, the altitude that you are at and the altitude that you are climbing or descending to. Um, come on, click, let's go. Uh, your intentions, what am, I here, what am I doing here? And the um, current ATIS letter, which we'll, uh, we'll talk about in just a moment. Um, the good news with this, though, is that you don't always have to give all of these. There's a lot of situations where you can omit some of these. If you are already radar identified as you check in with the next controller, you don't need to update your position. They can see your position. Um, your target has already kind of flashed on their screen so they know you're coming, so you really don't have to say your location. If you're IFR, you typically don't have to give your intentions. They know what your intentions are. It's in your flight plan. Um, the one example where you do kind of have to give all this information is if you're VFR and you maybe you were flying in class echo airspace and you weren't under flight following services, but now you're about to enter a Charlie airspace and now you do need to be in touch with air traffic control for the approach controller to sequence you in for your arrival. So in this case, you do have to give every bit of that stuff. Their call sign is Raleigh Approach. Yours is, well, you know, I'll just talk through it. Raleigh Approach, Comanche 514 Delta Victor. We're two zero miles west of the airport, 6,500, descending 4,500, inbound for a full stop of information delta. So it can be kind of a lot to spit out at once, but if you follow the same flow, maybe even sketch it out in a notepad or, um, or you know, on a, uh, or physically on a piece of paper ahead of time, it can help you. Uh, let's talk real quickly about readbacks. Readbacks are simple because it's really any kind of instruction that you get, they're going to want you to read back so that they can verify that you heard them properly. Um, the one thing that new that's in members do a lot is they read back pieces that aren't instructions and aren't necessary to be included in a readback. So, for example, when you get your landing clearance, you don't need to read back the winds. You haven't been instructed to do anything. That wind information is just for your information. Um, the other one is when you're getting your approach clearance. The first thing they say is you're five miles from 
Bodley or whatever the final approach fix is that they're vectoring you. So five miles from Bodley, maintain blah, blah, blah until so the five miles from Bodley part is just for your information. It's just a verification, especially if you're flying a plane without DME, which who does that anymore? Um, but, uh, but yeah, they'll give you that information just as a verification of how long it should be before you intercept that final approach course. But you don't have to read that back. They, they haven't instructed you to do anything. They're just letting you know that you're five miles from Bodley. Um, always include your call sign. Usually at the end, could be at the beginning, but always include your call sign so the controller knows that the person that they think they gave that instruction to is the one who is receiving it and following it. Another kind of daunting piece that we run across is the initial call for a clearance and the mouthful of stuff that the controller spits out at you all at once and then you have to be ready to read it back and you're like, oh my God, I'm never, never gonna remember all six pieces of this clearance and read it back right away. Well, the trick, there's two tricks. Number one, it comes in a standard order, okay? The order that I'm gonna give you is the US version. Outside of the US, the order's a little bit different but it is indeed a standard order everywhere you go. Um, so that can help you and then you can write out some of the information, most of the information, almost all of the information you know what it's gonna be before you even key up to request your clearance. So jot that all in first, and then when the controller starts speaking rapid fire, uh, you only have to focus on the pieces that might be A, changed from what you expected them to be, or B, the completely new information. But the uh, mnemonic that we use for it is called CRAFT, clearance limit route, altitude frequency, and transponder. Uh, you know, cleared to Kennedy Airport via um, the, What's the, what are the, I'm trying to remember one of my departures out of Dulles. Um, what's that? Yeah, the Jacoby, you know, the Jacoby three or Jacoby four, whatever it's on. Clearly the Jacoby four departure, such and such a transition then as filed. Maintain 3000, expect flight level whatever, 10 minutes after. And, uh, and then the, the, the departure controller's frequency and then uh, the transponder code. The transponder code is, uh, um, is, uh, just that four digit number that you dial in to identify yourself. Uh, and then the last piece that I'll give you on, um, on communication is when you're asked to report something in sight. The sanctioned responses if you're asked to report something in sight is you either have it in sight or negative contact. And I, I just, I've always laughed at that negative contact. It just sounds so dismissive. Um, you know, you, traffic ahead, uh, you know, five miles same direction, uh, 2,500 Piper Cub. Negative contact. I don't see him. I looked once. I gave up. It's your problem, controller. Uh, so I, I, I like looking as, as a response. So looking for the traffic, 5 and 4 Delta Victor. That way, uh, number one, it's a little more concise. It's shorter, one word. Uh, but secondly, it gives the controller some reassurance that, hey, if I do eventually spot this guy, I'll call you back and let you know. Um, what, I th what I recommend that you avoid at all costs is uh, saying like the traffic's, traffic's five miles, same direction, uh, Piper Comanche at uh, 3,500. Uh, okay, I don't have them in sight, 514 Delta Victor. Or I will report that traffic in sight, 514 Delta Victor. Because I can tell you that controllers are multitasking. And by the time they've issued your instruction, you're reading it back, but they're already looking at what they have to do next who they have to give an instruction to next. So they're halfway listening to your readback. So when the last thing you say is have it in sight, they expect that you have it in sight. So I, that's always, I would stick with, if you don't have it in sight, don't say anything I will report in sight or I, I'll let you know when I have it in sight or, or whatever. Again, just, just looking for the traffic, five and four Delta Victor. Um, there are some misconceptions that happen as you maybe have a lot of experience as a simulator pilot. You've done hundreds of flights, maybe even thousands of flights. You've done hundreds of flights in a very complex aircraft like a P, a, the PMDG airliners. So you feel like you know what you're doing. I know how to follow instructions, I know how to operate the plane. The only difference is I'm going to join VATSIM, I'm going to be talking to people rather than AI. Other than that, it's going to be the same thing. Um, inevitably, there are misconceptions and bad habits that you will have picked up along the way, but you, there's been no one to tell you that they're misconceptions or bad habits. So um, it's almost like the more experience you have prior to joining VATSIM, that can sometimes play against you. 
because it, it's, it's um, humbling to be told you don't know what you're doing when you have what you feel is a, a lot of experience. So let's talk about some of the, the major pitfalls that we see from new members joining that's in. Uh, the first one is choosing too busy of an area to, to fly in before you're truly comfortable. No matter how many times you've done um, you know, DCA to Boston um, in an AI or a single player environment, the first time you do it on VATSIM, it's gonna be a lot for you to, to learn and do. Um, make sure that there's, if there's air traffic control coverage there, make sure there's not a crap ton of traffic. Make sure that you're one of a handful of planes and not a handful of hundreds of planes. Um, it, yeah, and I've put on here, sometimes you just don't, you just don't know what you don't know. You don't under, you will learn some things the hard way on that sim that if you haven't, if you've built some, some of these bad habits, and we're going to talk about what some of them are. I'm going to help you avoid some of them, uh, but there's inevitably going to be some things you've learned the hard way. So it's better to learn those things in a less uh, densely packed air traffic control sector. Uh, another common pitfall is ne neglecting to locate charts for all the procedures and the routes. We talked about, we touched on that a little bit. I'm going to cover it in more detail in a couple of slides. Uh, runway assignments. SimBrief is lovely at providing you recommended runways, but they're not your assigned runways. So just keep in mind the difference. The runways that are actually in use at your departure airport and your arrival airport are determined by the VATS and air traffic controllers that are working in that airport, and it may not match what's in your SIM brief paperwork. Uh, the other thing about runway assignments is the, uh, well, the back, the back up step. The other thing about runway assignments is that the center controller usually does not know what runway you're gonna get. When, especially if it's like Atlanta, where there's five runways, now three of them probably in use for arrivals, but still, you know, the, the center controller knows that the airport's generally in a west flow, so there's one of three choices you're gonna get, but you're not gonna know which exact runway you get until you started that descent and you're handed off from center to approach. It doesn't really do you any good to ask Atlanta Center, what, what runway am I getting to for my arrival? It does you even less good to ask Memphis Center what runway you're getting at Atlanta for your arrival. Runway incursions uh, happen with new members because you're so used to the fact that uh, you get your taxi instruction and you just get on the runway and go. Um, however, uh, you should never enter a runway until you're specifically told that you can't. Uh, there are, in fact, five instructions that you can hear to, uh, to allow you to enter the, the runway from the ground, and I have a tutorial online that covers that in a little bit more detail. Um, there's a quick terminology thing about altitudes versus flight levels. I think um, there's a misconception that a flight level is just a, another way to say your altitude. There is a little bit of a nuance to it in which when you say you're at flight level 085, which you would never say in the US or Canada because our transition level is, anybody know? 18,000, right? Outside of the US and Canada, it is possible that you would be at flight level 085. That is not the same thing as being at flight level, at, at uh, I'm sorry, at, at 8,500 feet. Anybody know the difference? Right, I, I, I heard enough that I think someone's got it. So when you say I'm at 8,500 feet, the implicit message carrying along with that is that your altimeter is set to a locally observed uh, altimeter setting, uh, often provided to you by the controller. So, you know, if altimeter, you know, the descend maintain 8,000 uh, altimeter 3005. Okay, 8,000 altimeter 3005, five and four delta vector. Um, if you're outside of the U.S. and you're assigned flight level 080, uh, or they, sometimes they drop the leading zero there, so flight level 80, you're at 8,000 feet, but you're 8,000 feet calibrated to the standard altimeter, 2992, or in a lot of cases, it's uh, uh, 1013 uh, millibars or hectopascals. So there is a distinction there. When you say you're at a flight level, but you're calibrated to a local altimeter, it's not just that you've taken a shortcut in reporting your altitude, you've actually said something incorrect. So it's, it's good to know the difference. Um, with SIDS, we're gonna talk about altitude compliance and lateral compliance here, just a, another slide here. And then STARS, we're gonna talk altitude and lateral compliance as well. So again, it ties back to what I said a moment ago about why it's important to have the charts with you. Um, with, come on, forward, there we go. Um, with SIDS, one of the, the most common things that we see 
is uh, the initial altitude that you're provided. Think back to that IFR clearance, and I kind of rambled through it, but um, you know, cleared to Boston Logan Airport, Jacoby, whatever departure, whatever transition, maintain 3,000, expect flight level 35010 minutes after departure. So what's that maintain 3,000, that's got to be the value that you dial into this box right here. Uh, you don't want to put your cruise altitude. I think a lot of tutorials online about how to fly a PNDG that you see from this or that uh, YouTube streamer, they may not be doing this on a multiplayer network. If they are, they're busting through that initial altitude and they're really upsetting their departure controller. Um, on a multiplayer network, when the arrivals and the departures are being coordinated around each other, we, our, our goal is for them not to hit each other. So that's why it's important to maintain that initial altitude before you're cleared higher. So make sure you're putting the initial altitude into that box when you're setting your aircraft up, not your cruise altitude. Uh, the other one, the other way you'll get that instruction is climb via SID. What's that mean? Well, it simply means look at the chart and read the instructions. Lo and behold, it does indeed say there, um, you know, maintain, in this case 7,000, I think it is, can't quite see it. Uh, maintain 7,000 and then expect to be cleared after that. Um, with the lateral compliance on SIDS, the, 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 uh, we've got what we'll call three types of, uh, of, of SIDS in the US. These are the three common types, radar vector SIDS, pilot nav SIDS, and hybrid SIDS. But I'll make it even simpler for you. Um, really, we've got two types. We've got the type that you've joined the path on your own, and we've got the type that you um, have to be told how to join the path, okay? So in the case of a, uh, of a pilot nav, and man, I gotta walk over here and see. <laughs> There's our Jaco before. Um, so in the case of a pilot nav, like the Rinaldi, the, um, the instruction is really, it's not gonna be anything except join this path. Take off, take this path to this point, take this path to this point, and fly on. Uh, in the case of the hybrid and the radar, and the radar vector, you will literally see it says um, maintain X heading and expect vectors. Now, what heading is it that you maintain? A lot of times people go, oh, I'll just keep flying runway heading. Well, it's not always runway heading. This is, again, why you have to read the chart. Uh, in the case of uh, Dulles International, uh, if you're departing northbound, if you're departing on the ones, it is indeed runway heading. Uh, but if you're departing on the 19s or if you're departing uh, runway 30, uh, the chart dictates what heading you should be flying. You shouldn't need to be told this. If you accepted a clearance on the Jaco before departure, you already told us that you were going to do that. So as soon as you go wheels up, that's what you should be doing. Um, stars, again, we have vertical and uh, lateral compliance that you should, should be aware of. Um, we've got a couple types of stars. One is called a profile descent, and, and that is one where each point along the way has a, an assigned, not each point, many points along the way have uh, associated altitude uh, assignments. And um, <clears throat> The instruction that you're going to get to join this and, and start flying that profile is going to be descend via the blank arrival, descend via the arch to arrival in this case. This is um, St. Louis International. Um, they may need to tell you the overall landing direction, landing, you know, to descend via the arch to uh, St. Louis landing west or St. Louis landing east. Like I said, the center controller might not know which specific runway you're going to get because what if you're landing west, what are the choices at St. Louis? You might, be 11, you might be on one of the two 11s, 11 left, 11 right, you might be on 12. If they say you're landing east, it could be you know, 29 left, 29 right, or three zero. So they don't know which specific one you're gonna get, you'll get that from your approach controller, but the center controller at least has to tell you the overall landing direction, why? Because you need to know which of those two forks you're gonna take. Um, so, uh, So yeah, that's um, the other thing that, uh, that comes along with that, though, is that uh, you need to know what altitude you've been cleared to with that instruction. So descend via the arch two tells you I can descend to what? And it's very important that you know which altitudes you should be looking at here. Um, the ones in red are the, the segment, I've, 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 I've kind of crossed those out. You don't want to be looking at those. I mean, you, they're important, but not for this reason. The ones you want to be looking at are the, the altitudes at each uh, point along the way here. So if you're landing west, you're taking that fork off the bottom, 
the lowest you can descend to is 6,000 with this clearance. Descend via the arch to arrival, St. Louis landing west. You can't go any lower than six until they tell you. If they're landing east, then it's actually 5,000 at that point, um, Buell. So those are the two points you need to be looking at as far as what should I be setting that mode control panel to. Um, you might think, oh, well, I'm going to go that and then I'm going to start my approach, so I'm going to set it to the approach altitude. But you haven't been cleared to do that approach yet, so you can't lower that altitude until you've actually been cleared to join that approach. Um, the last thing here we'll cover is with um, STARS and their uh, lateral, lateral clearance. Uh, this is uh, a non-profile descent and the altitude, oh, I'm sorry, this is the other piece with vertical. Non-profile descent, so you'll get expected altitudes, uh, but you're not going to get assigned altitudes. The controller's not going to give you a descend via, it's going to be cross, um, cross such and such and at maintain, cross Calverton and then at and maintain one, two thousand feet. Uh, sometimes they'll say cross Calverton one, two thousand, they won't say and maintain. I would just treat it the same way. Um, you can ask if you're not sure, but uh, most of the time if they give you that and they don't give you any further instruction, they just want you to maintain that altitude until they give you lower afterward. All right, I know I'm over time. I'm going to real quick go through the lateral, um, lateral compliance issues that we see. We'll go back to, uh, we were on the parch, now we're back on the arch. Um, so the most common thing that we see with the stars that pilots tend to do is they, um, they pass that last point and then they turn right onto the approach without being told to. And again, I think it comes from YouTube tutorials that tell you, put in the SID, put in the route, put in the star, put in the approach, and then delete all the discontinuities. Um, again, that works fine if you're the only player in the sky. Um, but when you're being sequenced around traffic, it's very important that you follow these instructions and don't turn in onto the approach until you're told to. Um, expect radar vectors is the way it's almost always going to appear. Uh, when we look at the next page here, um, the narrative in the following page, expect radar vectors is going to be your, uh, your key phrase. So when you see that, you almost always are going to have to make sure that you're following a heading and not turning on to an approach uh, until you're told. I'm very sorry that I went so, uh, so quickly, guys. It is a lot to know. Um, but I, I encourage you to uh, find some more additional resources by jumping on my YouTube channel. I've got tutorials that cover a lot of this in much more detail. Um, so please feel free to avail yourself of that. Uh, another way to connect is to uh, find the Slant Alpha Adventures live stream on Twitch. Uh, we typically broadcast Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 7 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time. And then uh, we have a Discord community that's associated with that. I realized after watching Matt and Mike that I should probably just put a big QR code on the screen. I, I'm old school, and that's why I say I'm really old school. You can just email me. <laughs> but anyway, I do thank you for your time. I'll be available for some Q&A off to the side afterwards. And uh, again, I hope to hear you, see you in the skies, and hope that you guys will be healthy and safe in all of your travels and adventures this weekend. Thanks for your time, guys.